I'm Eric Marcus, and in this season of Making Gay History, I've been revisiting my past to tell you about the early years of the AIDS crisis, when I was coming out and coming of age as people around me were getting sick and dying. I've returned to memories from the 1980s, trying to reconstruct what happened, because it turns out it's part of our LGBTQ history, and because ultimately, it's the story behind Making Gay History, and how and why it came about. This is our sixth and final chapter, Making History. KABC, Talk Radio 790. This is Talk Radio, I'm Michael Jackson. I want to turn immediately to Eric Marcus, the author of The Male Couple's Guide to Living Together. We're speaking with uh, homosexual males who, uh, who are couples. Now, Throughout 1988, I crisscrossed the country promoting The Male Couple's Guide with appearances on local TV, CNN, and a lot of talk radio shows, where the calls range from hateful to heartfelt. Hi, John. Hi. Yes, sir. Uh, I was calling to tell you that we met, my lover and I, in 1956. We've been together since. And, and, 32 uh, years? Lot, yeah, we've had a lot, a lot in the early 50s, the late 50s, early 60s, and into the first part of the 70s, a lot of legal problems when it comes to buying and purchasing properties, uh, that sort of thing. And then they passed the law, you know, where singles could buy. And then we were able to buy our first property. So starting now would be a considerably easier situation for you than it was then. Yes. They, well, I don't know. With this AIDS scare, everybody's starting to, you know, to, uh, to wear the mask and uh, you know, burned the crosses again. Good morning. You're on the Talk of the Rockies with Peter Boyles. Our guest is Eric Marcus. The book, The Male Couple's Guide to Living Together. Uh, good morning, Peter. Uh, I'd just like to say uh, I'm getting tired of hearing uh, the old cop out about uh, they were born gay, and they've always been that way. I think it's just like with alcohol or drugs or any other bad habit, they've just gone ahead and got worse and worse, and they end up in a gay lifestyle. I've lived in San Francisco for three years, and uh, me and my wife and children shared a flat with five drag queens. I've been to the hardcore gay bars there, and they're lucky that the only disease they have is AIDS. You'll have to you'll have to give me a tour. This is Eric Marcus speaking. You'll have to give me a tour of the, the hardcore bar sometime because I haven't been. Um, first of all, uh, let me ask you a question. Okay. Um, were you born heterosexual? Um, I would say yes. Okay. If you can be born heterosexual, could it have been possible for you to be to have been born homosexual? I don't think so. Bob, do you believe that there have always been homosexuals? Well, sure, since Sodom and Gomorrah, of course. Okay, all right. Well, uh, let's say since Sodom and Gomorrah, there's always been homosexuals. But, but why do you think that happens? Do you think that it's it's an act of the devil that Eric Marcus likes to make love to his his boyfriend? I think it's because of a, a psychological uh, aberration. Actually, I wish I had more time to, to spend <laughs> physical yeah. time with my boyfriend. Uh, I, it had happened. I was officially a professional homosexual. I'd resisted the idea for a long time, but I found I was pretty good at handling homophobic callers and prudish radio hosts. Before heading out on the book tour, I really thought I'd be out there talking about male couple life, like a gay Dr. Ruth. But the questions turned out to be much more basic. They couldn't quite get over the fact of my sexuality. Asking how I became gay, how my parents reacted, callers telling me that people like me were mentally ill or morally wrong. And of course, questions about AIDS were never very far away. Can I ask you a, a, yeah. a personal question? Go ahead. Um, um, Eric Marcus is a gay male. Do you ever think that the time bomb might be there? All the time. You'd and, have to. Uh, my partner and I have not been tested. We've been together five, nearly five years. Uh, because of the incubation period, mm -hmm. either of us could potentially mm -hmm. develop a disease. Uh, <laughs> and I know this is away from the book, and I, I, sure. I, I don't mean to break it away from the book, but when I see the thrust in the commercials and the PSAs to test and to be safe and to find out, I have heard this, and I can't. This is empirical rather than statistical. Right. That more straight people are getting tested.
tested for AIDS now than gay people. Oh, you if I were straight, I wouldn't be afraid of being tested. That the odds of, of testing yeah. positive. If I were pretty sure that I test negative, I'd go out and get it now. Yeah, right. Just uh, a little insurance. Peace of mind. Peace of mind. But growing up when I did in a place like New York City, the odds are probably 50-50 or better that I could test positive. And that's too, mm. the odds aren't good enough for me to go out and get tested. Wow. Uh, it's a little too frightening. Why would you not be tested? You said neither you nor your partner would be tested. There's, that, there's a battle back and forth on that point. I really and the fallout from finding out that you're positive, HIV positive, is, is so damaging so often that we decided it's easier to live with the thought in the back, backs of our minds that we are negative and practice safe sex than to live knowing that we were positive. The back and forth between me and Barry about whether to get tested came to an end in the fall of 1988. That was three years after the first HIV test became available, and within a month of the publication of a new study in Scientific American about the drug AZT. The study confirmed that AZT was extending the lives of people with AIDS by a few months. Up until that time, there had been no clinically proven treatment. I confide in my Aunt Manette and Uncle Richie that Barry and I are getting tested. If the worst comes to pass, I want time to absorb that reality before having to tell anyone else. It turns out that I also talked to my sister, Heidi. During the AIDS crisis, did you ever have a concern about me? Yeah, well, I worried. I really worried. And uh, I remember there was a time in particular where you were very scared. That got me worried. When you worried. Uh-huh. Uh, we talked about it? Yeah, you told me you were going for a test and how worried you were. I think that someone that you were having a relationship with had tested positive. I talked more than I thought I had. Yeah. Um, it, yeah. Was a guy, it was a guy that mom set me up with. Oh, yeah. That's right. That guy, Bob, or something. No. Yes. Yes, it was Bob. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in 1981, and I don't remember his last name, I don't remember his mom's name, but his it, it, yeah. mom, our mom, and his mom met, and it was two Jewish mothers who decided to set their sons up. <laughs> yeah, and then mom called me, like, months after Bob and I had gone on a couple of dates that, that went well beyond dinner, and she asked me if I'd heard from Bob, and I said I hadn't, and I asked her why, and she said, well, he's in the hospital with that new gay disease. Yeah. That's so really that scary. was from, yeah, so that was, so I didn't realize I told you that, that, that before I went in to get tested. Yeah, yeah, so I, like really worried, like on pins and needles. It's been seven years since I was first knowingly exposed to HIV, and I could easily have been infected by any number of other guys in the interim, including Barry, before Safer Sex was even invented. Given the often long incubation period for developing full-blown AIDS, there's every possibility that I am a ticking time bomb and just don't know it. Barry and I decide to get an anonymous test instead of going to our doctor. We don't want to risk anyone finding out. The stigma and potential discrimination associated with AIDS could mean losing your job, your insurance. I call to make an appointment for us downtown at the city's public health clinic in Chelsea. I'm number 958 and Barry is 362, November 9th, 10.30 a.m. Just a couple of weeks before, I'd signed the contract to write my second book, an oral history about the gay and lesbian civil rights movement. I've been trying really hard not to think about what testing positive could mean for that book. It's due on my editor's desk in two years. I've watched too many friends waste away and die in much less time than that. So many unfinished books, unfinished lives. Barry and I step through the door of the Chelsea Clinic into an overheated lobby waiting room that's filled with people sitting in rows of attached greenish-blue plastic chairs. The air is thick. I feel faint. We're lucky to grab a couple of empty seats and wait for our numbers to be called. An hour later, blood drawn, band-aids on arms, we're out the door with an appointment to return for our results in three weeks. Barry heads back to the office. I return to my desk at home. Time turns to sludge for the next 21 days, slow and viscous, despite joyful distractions. Barry threw me a seemingly carefree 30th birthday party, all friends, no family, and then we spent Thanksgiving with family, no friends. Still, those three weeks felt like a year.
I'm Solve and I worked for the Department of Health in Chelsea, New York City. My job title was counseling and testing. People would come in and get counseling and get tested. And it was also uh, taking information uh, of what their risk factor was. Um, so my day was kind of filled with giving results, which was very difficult at times. Um, God, it's so hard to go back there because you almost don't want to. You know, a lot of sobbing, a lot of crying, a lot of, a lot of hand holding, a lot of, um, especially pregnant women, was really difficult. People needed us. They were discriminated against. Their families, you know, threw them out. They had no one but us. I came from the mindset of this is not a death sentence. I never looked at it that way. I looked at it like there are things you can do. You know, you have to now pay attention to your health, your your uh, physical, your your spiritual, everything, because that's all we had. We didn't have anything else. D Day, November thirtieth, nineteen eighty eight, nine thirty a.m. Barry and I are back at the Chelsea Clinic, waiting in the greenish blue plastic chairs. Our numbers are called, and we're met by two social workers. Barry and I couldn't; they wouldn't see us together. We wanted to be taken in together. We weren't married. We couldn't be married. So we were sent with separate people. And I was assigned to you. The petite blonde woman clutching the file containing my results was Salve. My goodness, 33 years ago. <laughs> That's all. It's like yesterday, Salve. Oh my goodness, Eric. Let me tell you, tell you the story of how it unfolded and oh. see if you remember anything. So I remember going into your office um, you smiled, um, you showed me, indicated where I should sit, and I sat mm -hmm. next to your desk. You had the file on your desk, you opened the file, and as you were doing this, it was like a movie to me, because suddenly I couldn't hear anything except the blood rushing through my ears, and my heart pounding, and the color left the room. It was, it was, um, it was, a, it was terrifying. And you opened the file. I can see you opening the, the file. And you looked down and you smiled and you looked up at me. And you said, you're negative. And I almost fainted. Um, the sound came rushing back. The color came back into the room. And I didn't cry, but I was, I was giddy. And then I thought, oh, my God, what about Barry? Because he was in another room in the building getting his test results. So I, you, you, you gave me some information about, mm -hmm. about how to stay negative. Uh, you had handed me um, a little slip of paper. Um, it said Salve. Yeah, I know. And it was written by me. It was my handwriting. So it said Salve and it had my number. Yeah. It was anonymous testing. Um, and I thanked you and you wished me well. And I left your office and went down the hall back to the lobby. Mm -hmm. And there were lots of people sitting in plastic chairs. And then there was Barry. We're standing there. We don't know what each other's results are. And we start giggling. And that's when we realized we were both yeah. negative. But then there you were over my shoulder, and you said to us, come with me. And Barry said, why? And, and I said to Barry, I don't know why she wants us to go down the hallway, but whatever she wants, let's just do it. And so, so you took us down the hallway looking for an empty room. And there was none. You took us to the end of the hall. You took each of our you took a, each of our hands and held our hands, and you said, "I deliver terrible news every day, all day, and I just want to share. I just want to share in a moment of happiness with you. That's why I've remembered you all these years. That's why I saved that little slip of paper and put it with my birth certificate and my old passport." Because, um, because of that moment. It was so human of you and so um, beautiful um, and so meaningful. And I've never forgotten you. Well, thank you for sharing that. I, I don't remember that. But I'm so glad that I did that. I am so grateful for all the people like yourself that I tested and, and um, that I had the opportunity to connect with. I am the lucky one. 
because I saw people work so hard. Like if somebody was positive, like I get, like even being negative, I gave you the same information. This is what you need to do. You need to do this, this, and this. And it's about your health and it's about, you know, your well being. You, you need to, like, you know, I feel privileged that you allowed me. It's such a vulnerable thing. I mean, it's intimate. It is, it is. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Standing in that hallway with you. With you holding our hands, it couldn't have been more intimate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. and letting me into your lives, you know, giving all this information that I'm asking behind closed doors, you know, know me and and being able to be vulnerable to 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 tell me, yeah, to talk to me. Well, I got lucky that I got you, and I was lucky I got you. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like blown away by this whole thing. <laughs> Reconnecting after more than 30 years, thanks to a social media search sparked by that slip of paper I'd saved all these years, brought even more memories flooding back. And then we step, went out on the street, and I had told my aunt that I, I, that I was getting tested. And we were on the corner of 29th and 9th Avenue, and there was a, a phone booth directly across the street. And I said, Barry, we need to get to that phone booth. And he stepped off the curb into traffic without seeing that there were cars coming, and it was against the light. And I grabbed him and pulled him back. I remember thinking, oh, my God, we just got tested. We found out we're negative, and you're going to get killed because you weren't paying attention to the light. And it's my fault because I told you we have to get to that phone booth. <laughs> we get to the phone booth, and I called my aunt yeah. and told her, after she said, thank God, she said, have you called your grandmother? And I said, why? And she said, call your grandmother. And it turns out, I just talked to my aunt about this the other day. She said, and I'd come out to my grandmother uh, not that long before that, several months before that, she said it's all she talked about. She was just so worried that you would get sick and die. And she'd never said anything. So the next phone call from that phone booth was to my grandmother to tell her that we were HIV negative. Every aspect of that day is seared into my memory. But for Salve, I was just one of the many people she counseled or supported over decades of work in HIV AIDS. You saw hundreds and hundreds of people but I wanted you to know um, how much meaning that had for me. Um, and it made me, it, I could live my life. Um, I wasn't going to die from this. And I assumed you wouldn't know who I was. But you, you um, have stayed with me all of these years. Um, I don't know, you know, like how we affect people or what. We don't ever know how fortunate I am to know that I did something that was meaningful. It was so meaningful. Um, but it's such a, it's such a vivid, um, pivotal moment in my life. And you were there, and I'm grateful to you for that. I'm so grateful. Now, I don't ever want to let you go. I want to stay <laughs> forever. <laughs> With the HIV test behind me, the terror that had been a constant hum for seven years turned down several notches, and I could turn my full attention to my oral history book. I had very grand plans for how I was going to write my book. I'd do 250 interviews across the country, choose the best 40 or 50, and use those oral histories to tell the story of the lesbian and gay civil rights movement from around World War II until 1990. I first had to build a timeline of the movement because none existed. That meant lots of hands-on research, poring over old magazines and the two available books on gay history. And at the same time, I had to start doing interviews because the clock was ticking. And it wasn't just my two-year deadline. There were men with AIDS and old people I wanted to interview whose time was running out. I made lists, filled out index cards, cross-referenced everything, made interview appointments, flight reservations, and arranged to sleep on friends' couches in cities across the country. I had the sense that these were important interviews, and I figured someday someone might want to use them for something. I didn't know what. So I asked my former boss at CBS for advice. He used to work for National Public Radio, and I asked what equipment his colleagues use, and then I go out and buy it. Interview with Wendell Sayers, Saturday, January 14th, 1989. Interview with Gene Manford and Morty Manford on Saturday, May 13th, 1989. Interview with Chuck Rowland, Tuesday, August 22nd, 1989. Interviewer is Eric Marcus. Location is the home of Dr. Hooker in Los Angeles, California. Tape one, side one. Very quickly, I could hear that the stories I was collecting, the lives I was recording, were precious. 
And even though I wasn't going to die from AIDS, I began to worry that something else would happen to me along the way and I wouldn't get to finish the book. A plane crash, car accident, a coronary. I was also afraid that something would happen to the tapes. So as soon as I got home from an interview, I'd make a duplicate and I stored the dupes in a separate secure location. And once I was well into the project, every time I set out on another trip, I'd write a letter to my editor and tell him where I was in the project so he could hire another writer if something happened to me. I put the letter and a set of diskettes with the latest files in a padded envelope and FedEx the whole thing back to New York. By then, Barry and I had moved to Barry's home state of California, to San Francisco. I did almost nothing but work, between the book and freelance writing gigs to help cover my expenses. Once I'd recorded 89 interviews, I realized that if I didn't stop and start transcribing, I wouldn't have enough time to edit the interviews and write the book. Since I had a limited budget, I did all my own transcriptions of the hundreds of hours of tape and wound up with such a bad case of tendonitis in both wrists that I had to wrap them in ace bandages every night so I could sleep. The book wasn't about the AIDS crisis, but there was no way of writing a book like this at the end of the 1980s without the epidemic's influence and consequences rising through the voices of so many of the book's subjects and onto its pages. Interview with Damien Martin, Saturday, December 11th, 1988. Interviewer is Eric Marcus. Location is the home of Damien Martin in New York City. Tape one, side one. One of the first interviews I scheduled in late 1988 was with Damien Martin, Dr. Emery Hetrick's surviving partner. Emery had died from complications of AIDS in 1987. Damien was ill. In the late 70s, Damien and Emery had co-founded a radical, groundbreaking organization called the Institute for the Protection of Lesbian and Gay Youth, an institute that continues today as HMI, the Hetrick Martin Institute. Sitting with Damien in December of 1988, I asked him what it was like to go on without his partner at his side. Three months before Emery uh, died, I was diagnosed with AIDS. And um, poor baby, I remember he was upset on a number of levels, but the major one was who's going to take care of you, you know, like you've taken care of me. And in one way, it was easy for me because he was so much sicker that my illness sort of didn't have much reality. Um, I think the main reason I was able to handle it was because I really thought I was going to die very soon, so it didn't matter that much. So what I did was I just got even more involved in the Institute with the idea of um, getting things ready for when I was going to leave, to, uh, you know, just that there would be an organization that would be strong enough that could survive the loss of the two of us and that would go on because, uh, well, this may sound corny, I think the, the institution is much more important than any of us. And, mm -hmm. uh, plus, I also felt as though I was working with Emory. And so in a way, there it, it helped me with my grief uh, in the sense that uh, it was not like I'd lost everything. We still were working together. And... Uh, I must admit, I, I have um, difficulties. I usually just don't think about death anymore. But every once in a while, it'll come. It'll come in various ways. I'll uh, be buying a suit, and I'll think, what the hell are you buying a suit for? You'll probably be dead in six months. And I'll think, well, I'll see you'll be a well-dressed corpse, and I'll, and I'll buy the suit. Um, so the end doesn't frighten you? No. No, because you've already started. Right. Yeah. Interview with Vito Russo, Wednesday, December 21st, 1988. Location is Vito Russo's home in New York City. Interviewer is Eric Marcus, tape one, side one. Also at the top of my list was Vito Russo. He was a legendary changemaker. Vito shook up the film industry with his 1981 book, The Celluloid Closet, which was about how Hollywood's bigoted portrayal of gay men and lesbians helped shape public opinion about homosexuals. Vito co-founded GLAAD, a media watchdog organization originally called the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation. He also co-founded ACT UP, the AIDS coalition to unleash power. Vito had been entwined with the gay rights movement in New York for decades and had lost so many loved ones to AIDS, including his boyfriend, Jeffrey, who had died in March 1986. He's been gone almost three years now, and I'm still sick. And I'm very lonely. You know, it's hard to live alone and be sick alone. And as many of your friends as you have, and I have good, loving friends and a great support system, people cannot be sick for you. No. And they can't suffer for you, and they can't be with you all the time. 
gay life is very interesting now because we've divided into the positives and the negatives in some cases. And it's difficult to meet people, <clears throat> and then on top of that you meet somebody who likes you or whatever, and then you have to deal with the fact that you're sick, and you have to tell them that, and you have to hope that they can handle it. I mean, ju you know, who the hell is going to get into a relationship with somebody who is probably going to die soon? You know, they don't want to put themselves through that. Is it so painful? Because it is so terribly painful, and I know how painful it is. I've lost too many people. It's really astonishing when you look back on it and you think, most of the people who are my friends are dead. Most of my friends are dead. And at this age, that shouldn't be. You're only 42. Yeah, yeah. it's not natural no. by any definition of the word natural. The images I've seen of you in the last couple of years, well, I've seen you on television. Mm. I've seen you in a very, very activist role. Yes. So it's been a, has it been age then that's per, per <coughs> Yeah, it has. Mm -hmm. It has. I mean, I was uh, one of the people, um, who, along with Larry Kramer and Vivian Shapiro and Tim Sweeney and a couple other people who founded ACT UP, which became a whole new phase of activism, not only for me, but for the community in general. And it's a new kind of activism because it's created a coalition. ACT UP is composed of gay people and straight people women and men, black and white, you know, and all these people have one thing in common, and that's they want to put an end to the AIDS crisis when by, you know, any means possible. On October 8th, 1990, I interviewed CNN business anchor Tom Cassidy. Office of Tom Cassidy at CNN in New York City. Interviewer is Eric Marcus, tape one, side one. Tom got to be one of the first openly gay national news correspondents. Not because he'd intended to be, but because his AIDS diagnosis forced him out of the closet. He decided to use his diagnosis as a way of educating the public when CBS in New York approached him about a special series. Would you agree to participate in a story, a series, that we want to do about AIDS through your eyes? And AIDS was turning 10 years old in CBS's eyes. They wanted to look at the plague through my eyes. Ten years later. Yeah. And uh, I gave him a very, f I didn't even blink, I just said, and that kind of threw him, because he thought he was going to have to sell me on it. Right. And I said, sure. Why'd you say, sure? Because that meant coming out about having AIDS publicly and about being gay. I wanted to do some good. What could you do? Uh, make AIDS patients feel better. Mm -hmm. Make the public understand that some of their TV newsmen are gay and sick. Uh, everyone identified me as one of the, the good guys. And there are millions of people that have seen me on television. And I wanted them to know that a favorite of theirs could get this disease. And, it, and secondarily, he happened to be gay. Uh, what would that show them? But what would that show? What would <coughs> well, that AIDS is a is a, a much. It's not just a gay problem. Uh, when when um, gay people die of AIDS, the society is so much poorer because, in a lot of ways, uh, gay people um, are the spice of life. Life isn't as much fun in this country after losing 85,000 very creative, uh, well-intentioned, funny, um, productive people in the primes of their lives. And the straight world sort of knew it, but they really needed to have it mapped out right in their face. I didn't think I had anything to lose by trying it. I guess I really wanted to make a political statement. As a gay person as well as an AIDS patient. Damien Martin, Vito Russo, and Tom Cassidy. All three men would be dead before my book was published. And then there was Morty Manford. I always identified so strongly with him. A couple of gay Jews from Queens who wanted to make the world a better place for people like us. 
Morty and his mother, Jean, had co-founded an organization for parents of gay people back in 1972 that's now called PFLAG. Morty had also been the president of the Gay Activist Alliance and a major leader in the post-Stonewall gay liberation phase of the movement in New York City. Interview with Morty Manford, tape two, side one. I talked to Morty over two visits. I had the sense he wasn't well, but skirted the issue of AIDS right up until the very end of our last session together. I think the component in all of this is anger, and even more deeply felt now because of AIDS, because people have died. Uh, people are hurt. Mm -hmm. You see your friends all around you dying. Has that had a significant impact for you? Yeah, I guess it has. Is there something I shouldn't ask? It affects all of us. I mean, it's, it's, it's devastating. Well, what about you? I mean, in terms of your friends, have you had friends? Yeah, yeah. We all have, haven't we? Yeah. Uh, my lover's fine. Uh, my best friend's lover has AIDS. So it's that close, but it hasn't... Uh, we went and got tested last year, and we both were shocked by the, the, the results. Um, so he came out in San Francisco, I came out in New York, and the statistics were not in my favor. Mm. Um, I still thank God every morning, because the statistics, given the statistics, I should not... I shouldn't even be alive, given where I was and what I did. Well, what have, what have we lost? 65,000 people so far, mm -hmm. and uh, a million of us, a million of us, it's not all gays, but um, a million people, they say, are infected now. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's. It's, a, it's just uh, impossible to grasp mm -hmm. that. Do you ever wonder what would have happened if not for the work you and many others did in the late 60s and early 70s? If AIDS had happened in pre-1970 times? Well, I put it in terms of the gay movement. Mm -hmm. if there hadn't been a movement, we would be ill-prepared. Not that uh, we've had uh, the kind of resources we should have to deal with it today, but at least we've got our own infrastructure that's been there to assist and press for greater resources. You know, a few years ago, when the hysteria was much greater, we had these lunatics calling for uh, gays or people infected with AIDS to be put in a concentration camp kind of setting. And uh, there was some popularity to that idea. There was no telling what would have been and in, the, in this context, given the enormous fear and devastation of the disease, but for the movement and all those wonderful people out there and, and you know, all the gay organizations and, 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 and social service outfits and political groups, we've been pretty horrendous. I think the uh, existence of the AIDS crisis has given a lot of bigots fodder. They've used the AIDS issue to camouflage their prejudice or to justify it. But I, I, think, I, think, I think we've done pretty good in uh, at least holding, you know, back that... that uh, pressure to uh, uh, backtrack. 
I'm, you know, not being terribly articulate. Last time we spoke, it was it was in the morning, and you're being just as I, articulate. You just don't. No, I'm not. I'm 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 I'm, I'm you're fading, grasping for yeah. words, and it's okay. But, uh, I can add it just the same. Thank you. Anything you want to add? On your next trip to New York, if uh, I think of something else, uh, I'm, I'm sure will. It wasn't until years later that I discovered Morty had been diagnosed just a couple of weeks before that conversation. Like Damien, Vito, and Tom, Morty didn't live long enough to see his story in print. A few months before the book was set to be published, Jean Manford called to tell me that her son was dying. She said Morty was upset that so many of the movement's triumphs, the untold stories of the fight for gay liberation, might be lost with the deaths of people like him. He feared they'd be forgotten, that he'd be forgotten. I sent Jean the pre-publication manuscript of the book so she could read Morty's chapter aloud to him. He was home, extremely frail, and no longer able to read it for himself. Morty died on May 14th, 1992. He was 41. The first edition of Making Gay History, which was called Making History, was published two and a half weeks after Morty's death. Postscript Morty Manford, Damian Martin, Vito Russo, and Tom Cassidy were just four of the seven people I interviewed for the book who would ultimately die of complications from AIDS. It wasn't until the mid-1990s that there were effective, life-saving treatments for HIV-AIDS. And 40 years after that first New York Times headline about a rare cancer seen in 41 homosexuals, there's still no vaccine. In 2019, the most recent year for which U.S. statistics are available, there were approximately 35,000 new HIV infections. 1.2 million people were living with HIV. Around 5,200 died from AIDS-related causes. And worldwide in 2020, approximately 37 million people were living with HIV. 680,000 died from AIDS-related illnesses. Globally, since the start of the epidemic, AIDS has cost 36 million people their lives. If you look at the dedication page at the front of that first 1992 edition of Making History, you'll see that I dedicated the book to three people. My grandmother, because she was my rock and paid for the computer on which I wrote it. My mother, because my grandmother said that to keep the peace, I couldn't dedicate the book to her unless I included my mother and put her first. As ever, Grandma May was right. And I dedicated it to Homer. That was my nickname for Barry, because his fingerprints are on almost every page of the book. I couldn't begin to count the number of times I asked him to read something, edit a passage, or to offer his advice when I hit a wall and couldn't write another word. My relationship with Barry does not have a fairy tale ending, despite how it began on a sailboat on Peconic Bay back in 1983. I'm Shane O'Neill. I'm here at Eric Marcus's house, and it's our third session taping of Eric's oral history. How are you feeling, Eric? I liked interviewing people better than I like being interviewed. What? Now, forgive me if this is too personal. We can just skip over it. Did anything change in your relationship with Barry? When was your next HIV test? What was your thinking in terms of how it impacted your relationship? It's not too personal a question, and I have thought about it. And um, AIDS pretty much killed the joy in our sex life. And we never found our way back. I was still terrified. Um, And we still practiced very, very safe sex. Um, And I still have anxiety all these years later. And I've obviously been tested since. Um, I shouldn't say obviously, I've certainly been tested since. Um, It was such a terrifying time that I couldn't, even though I knew he was negative and, and, and I was negative, it wasn't as if we could throw open the doors and skip into the street and say, we can do everything. We're both, we're both negative. Barry and I were elated and relieved that we were negative. Um, we didn't 
go back to having the kind of sexual relationship that we'd had. Barry and I split up three months after Making History was published, and I moved back to New York City. Our relationship unraveled for so many reasons, not just our loss of intimacy. It was complicated and painful. He threw me out, and he had every right to. Barry found love again and spent the last 18 years of his life with the love of his life, who was at his side when Barry died of pancreatic cancer in May 2020. He was 67. I found love again, too. My partner Barney and I have been together for 27 years. My understanding of what it takes to have a mutually satisfying, committed relationship now goes well beyond having a bedroom with wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, 100% wool. We work at it together. Decades of therapy have helped. I walk past an otherwise nondescript brick building nestled in a grove of mature London plane trees a few times a week. It's just a few blocks north of where Barney and I live in Chelsea. I never pass that squat beige clinic without thinking about the first time I got tested there for HIV. Sometimes I get a sinking feeling in my stomach when I think about an all-too-easy-to-imagine alternative reality where the good news I got there was bad. Other times it takes my breath away when I consider how lucky I am when so many others were not. And still, other times I look at that New York City Department of Health building and think of it as the place where I was born again at age 30. Many thanks to our hardworking crew at Making Gay History, including story editor Sara Birmingham, assistant producer and sound designer Ray Kantrowitz, deputy director Inga Tataya, researcher Brian Faree, research intern Amelia Donhauser, photo editor Michael Green, and our social media producers Christiana Pena and Nick Porter. This episode was mixed and mastered by Evan Viola. Special thanks to Will Coley for his production help. This season was recorded at CDM Sound Studios. Thanks as well to our interviewer slash oral historian Shane O'Neill and our listening circle, including Sid Ballou, Cheryl Ferjanik, Dr. Jamila Humphrey, Barney Karpfinger, Ann Northrup, Benjamin Riskin, Jenna Weiss Berman, and Mike Weinrip. Thanks also to Salve Simonson and Heidi Katz for sharing their memories. And special thanks to research sleuth Tyler Albertario and genealogist Michael Leclerc for helping to find Salve. Thank you to the New York Public Library's Manuscripts and Archives Division for their assistance. Our theme music was composed by Fritz Myers with additional scoring by Ray Kantrowitz. This season of the podcast was made possible by the generous support of the Jonathan Logan Family Foundation, Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS, the Calamus Foundation, the Kipper Family Foundation, Christopher Street Financial, Andrew and Erwin Press, Joel Sakuda and Christopher Williams, Bill Cox, Louis Bradbury, Jeff Soroff, Kathy Dancer, Mitchell Drazen, Brian, Christine, and Alex White, and scores of other individual supporters. Coming of Age During the AIDS Crisis is a production of Making Gay History. This season was my story. Stay tuned for our next season. We're planning to bring you a range of voices from the HIV AIDS epidemic, people you might not have heard from before, but whose stories and experiences will help bring this history to life. I'm Eric Marcus. So long, until next time.